everyone. Thank you for being here today at San Francisco Public Library. I'm Michelle Jeffers, Chief of Community Programs and Partnerships. Let me do a brief land acknowledgement for our spaces. The San Francisco Public Library acknowledges that we occupy the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramatush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. We recognize that we benefit from living and working on their land, and we recognize as uninvited guests that, that they affirm their sovereign rights as First Peoples, and we wish to pay our respects to them. Thank you. I also wish to thank friends of the San Francisco Public Library who support all our library events, and Book Passage, who is in the back of the room selling books that I know many of you have partaken of tonight. So thank you very much. Our authors tonight, of course, need no introduction, but I'm going to give you a brief one anyway. <laughs> so uh, Susan Perry is an Iranian-American novelist, journalist, essayist, and book reviewer. She grew up in both the United States and Iran until the 1979 Islamic Revolution forced her family into permanent exile. Since then, her writing has focused on stories of displacement and belonging, of identity and assimilation, of trauma and resilience. Her first novel, The Fortune Catcher, has been translated into six languages. Her new, much anticipated novel is In the Time of Our History, again, for sale in the back of the room. She is a member of the National Book Critics Circle, the Authors Guild, the San Francisco Writers Grotto, one of our library partners, and the Castro Writers Cooperative. Um, she divides her time between Northern California and New York. Amy, of course, is the best-selling author of The Joy Luck Club, The, kitchen, the Joy Luck Club, The Kitchen God's Wife, The Hundred Secret Senses, The Bone Setter's Daughter, Saving Fish from Drowning and Valley of Amazement. She is the author also of two memoirs, The Opposite of Fate and Where the Past Begins, and two children's books, The Moon Lady and Sagwa, the Chinese Siamese Cat. She has been a co-producer, co-screenwriter, and creative consultant for film and television productions of her books. And she also wrote the libretto for the opera, The Bone Setter's Daughter. She is an instructor of a master class on fiction, memory, and imagination. Her current project, the Backyard Bird Chronicles will be published in 2024, and we hope she'll be back at the library for that. After their talk this evening, we'll be doing a Q&A, both with our Zoom um, participants and a live Q&A in the room. We are recording this, so we will be passing out microphones for you to use, so please don't start asking your question until a microphone is in front of your mouth. I appreciate that. Again, thank you to Book Passage. Thank you to everyone for coming out tonight on a Tuesday night. Welcome, warm welcome to them again. Thank you. Thank you all for coming tonight. I'm so glad it's not raining. <laughs> if you saw my Facebook post, then you know that I am in love with this book. This is one of the best books I have ever read. I'm not just saying that because Suzanne is somebody I've known for a while, what, 30 years? Something like that. Um, she and I met in 1990. 89, 89, right after I was published, and she joined our writers group uh, when she was writing The Fortune Catcher, and that was published in 1997, and the now here century. it is, 26 <laughs> years, last century, 26 years have passed, but I, I do want to say that she has been busy doing other things, not just writing this novel, she's a journalist, an essayist, she's put literary events together. She puts together gatherings of women to encourage each other, inspire and support each, um, each other. Over these years, we've shared long conversations about family, about writing, about uh, what politics, about skiing, about kids. And um, I'm looking forward to this new conversation that we've never had before, which is about this book. Uh, and I think that there is so much to talk about that we're going to have to continue this over dinner and many other dinners after that. <laughs> um, I wanted to tell you some things that I love about this book by reacting as I did, not just as a reader, but as a writer. Um, and there were so many times that I was reading along and I'd say, oh my God, how does she know these things? Or how did she come up with this metaphor? This is incredible, you know, to be able to con con encapsulate something that's very complex with a, a great deal of clarity of what the actual issue is. And so um, 
that's what I'm, uh, I'm hoping that we'll find out some of the answers to how you put this together. Um, I also want to um, s start off by asking a question, I think, that is always at the top of everybody's mind when you read a novel, and the novel concerns family. And it has to do with, are these characters real? Did this really happen, this incident here? Is that where it happened? Is that what the house looks like? So let me begin, Suzanne, by asking, who in your family is really pissed at you for your having <laughs> written this book? Um, if there are any family members who are mad at me, um, they haven't mentioned it yet. Um, so I don't know for sure. Uh, the one I would be most concerned with is my father, who's still alive, and I think watching from New York. Um, he's 99 years old, and I had a phone call from him last night. He is listening and reading the novel at the same time. It's on his computer screen in, in large print, and he called me because he was confused about some of the characters and who this was and who that was. And I said, well, I'll try to draw a family tree for you. And he didn't understand, or he, he sort of does understand that these are, this is not our family, and he is definitely not the father. And um, because the father is not the most wonderful person. But of course, this is a family like mine in that it's a large extended family. Many of the members had to flee Iran after the 1979 revolution, and a lot of them landed here. And I lived here with my mother and father and my siblings, and we were sort of the, um, they were all the anchor babies and we were <laughs> the citizens. Um, and that was 45 years ago, and the family has grown tremendously. Uh, they're not in real estate, but um, uh, anyway, so it is similar in that sense. I have always viewed the world from the point of view of somebody who belongs to a large, diverse clan of people. And so I don't think I could write a novel that did not come <laughs> from that point of view. So I know Suzanne and her family enough to know that her father is nothing like the father in this book. He's a dear, sweet man. So um, just keep that in mind when you're reading this. And, and also, her, her husband is not like any of the husbands or lovers who are in no, this No, my husband book would shop. like to believe that he's in this like book. Like Julian. Yeah. He's kind of a nice, yeah, Sorry. A nice guy, a cute guy. <laughs> um, OK. Here's a hard question. Between your first book being published and these 26 years going by, what changed in the writing of this? Why, what happened? Uh, it's hard to answer that question. There, there are so many reasons why it took me this long. Um, some of them, my own uh, internal reasons um, that involved, and some of them just the market. When I published The Fortune Catcher, Iran, people's reaction to Iran was, ew, hostages, don't want to read about that. And it's changed in the last 25 years. There's a whole new generation of people who have Iranian heritage living here and living in other parts of the world. And Iran has changed a great deal so I think there is an interest now. And with the recent uprisings, the feminist protests in Iran, of course, I, this book became timely because of that. And I'm glad for that, but I'm also horrified by what's going on. And um, I'm hoping that this will be able to shed some light for some people on yeah. what Iran is, what Persian culture is, and how broad and diverse it is. Yeah. You, you mentioned early in the book, I think it's fairly early, and we've talked about some of this before, about there's a dichotomy here that has to do with ideology, politics, religion, what the country was, what it's become, what is becoming. And it is in these terms, Persia, Iran, 
Muslim, Muslim. And I think when I first met you, you used this word Muslim, which I remembered from a childhood, you know, Bible school, and there were Christians and Muslims and Jews, you know, and so you were the Muslim. And <laughs> tell me just a little bit about what is contained in those as concepts. So Persian it refers to the culture and the region, and Iran refers to the country that looks like a cat, that if you ever look at uh, a map. Uh, and it's the Islamic Republic, and has been for 45 years. Um, so Persianate culture goes way, way, way back to several empires um, and through several religions. The Muslim or Muslim or Arab invasion of Iran that happened in the seventh century is what turned Iran into a Muslim country. We say Muslim, I think that's the sort of British way of writing it, but we say it also because when you say the word Muslim in, in Farsi, you say Mosalman, you don't say Muslim. That is a very sort of Arab or, or South Asian way of saying Muslim. Um, we just don't say it that way, and so it's hard for me to say it that way. Mm. So, uh, and it also, I think, reflects a time, a histor historical time, when we would, that's what we knew, the Mohammedans or the Muslims. So that's the difference. Well, if you go back far enough, there was a time, you know, Persia, Asia, China, um, Chinese culture had a great deal of respect for Persian culture, and you see it in the museums of the art that was borrowed. So anyway, we're related. Go back far enough in Definitely. the DNA, and we've got some relatives for sure. Definitely. Um, <laughs> I, um, I often find our books are, are described as mother-daughter tales, and, and for me, they, they often are. Those are the main characters. You do have a mother and a daughter in here. You have many, many family members, as a matter of fact, these intersections in this very fractured family. Um, and you have this going on in a particular time of history, or several points in that time, sort of before and during and after and post and post in the new generation. So there is this sense of this family in a particular time, and you include a very interesting structure in your book in which you have interleaving, they're like compartments or... Uh, interludes, somebody, interludes, somebody called them interludes. Yes, interludes. That's, Jane Chavatari called them interludes. That's the word, that's the word. I, I had something called interludes too, that, thank you. Um, interludes that start off in the time of our history and then you encapsulate it with um, it's either very personal or it could be about say Salman Rushdie or it could be about the release of the hostages um, and I and it could be about a character but it 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 brings to mind all the ways that our history impacts us globally down to the very personal. So That's I want to exactly. ask you, you chose a title. Titles are very important. They're like, what this book means to me. What does this book mean to you and why that title? So I, I didn't think that would be the title. I just knew that towards the end of the process of writing this, these interludes came to me. Um, and I'm not saying they came to me from like woo woo came to me and like I didn't know you know as if somebody was talking to me a ghost or something. They just seem necessary to tie things up and to also to make sense of a lot of what I was writing about. And they're very different in style from the way I write. And I puzzled over that. And I realized eventually, when I was done with them, that they sound like Persian poetry. And I'm not literate in Persian. So this kind of flowery Persian poetry, which is so important to the Persian culture still, it just, it must have permeated my yeah. soul. Yeah. And mm. so in the time of our history is a flowery way that you would say, in the past, this happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when I use the word our, for me, it was about me being transnational 
and multi-ethnic and multi-religious because our history to me happens everywhere and it, it happens all at once sometimes. And it's a reflection um, both of the past and of the present. So that was for me, and, and what happens personally is related to what's happening politically or societally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were markers. They're markers for me. You know, I did get that sense when you said it's like poetry, and it did have a, diff a feel to that was is almost fable-like in the beginning. Fable-like. So at first, I called them. To little, me, they were fairy tales. Yeah, uh, very fable-like, and and then it was nice to have this resonant style. Uh, that was there, and you said you didn't intend to do it at first, but it, it gradually, as you write, these, this form of a novel seems to come together. Some, you know, you have to get into it before you know what you need to be part of that structure. Um, I also was thinking there was a lot in here that made me wonder if your writing style, your your sense of yourself as a writer, has has changed over time, so that all these things that have always been in you started to come out, almost subconsciously, um, maybe unawares until somebody like me points it out. Um, because we don't want to be too analytical about what we're writing while we're writing it. You know, we can't deconstruct when we're constructing. It's the antithesis of being creative to do that. So. There may be my interpretation of what Suzanne has done in her novels may not be exactly true for what she did, but I think that it might also create some awareness that you may not be that aware of. So one of the one of the things that I loved in your novel is that sometimes you would take in the you would use the voice of a character to provide a perspective on something very complex, and it would be as though it's his opinion, her opinion, but it, it contains a lot that has to do with a whole bunch of things going on in, the, in this dialogue, but in dialogue of the outside world, uh, what's happening now. I'll just read you one of them. Um, this is by a character um, named Nizam, and he says, he knew there was no such thing as a typical American. The country was vast. He believed there were broad cultural traits, but he couldn't remember the last time he'd considered them or the ways in which they compared to other nationalities. He was American, as were his wife and kids. And when you lived in America, the rest of the world somehow receded. He realized this was what he'd once liked least about the culture how it saw itself as above and apart. It was a mindset you put the whole idea of America at risk of disappearing. So can you talk about what's at risk? What might disappear? So I think the way we define ourselves as Americans, you know, we often say we're a country of immigrants, and we are, unless you are native to this country, you're either a colonizer or an immigrant or both. And no matter how far you go, everybody, no matter how many generations have been here, if you look back, that's who we are. And that's, everybody has that history who is a citizen in this country, unless you're native. So if we try to make ourselves be a unique civilization, here on Earth, the way we have sort of exceptionalized ourselves as being, um, then we're no longer what we've defined ourselves as being. So what is America if it's no longer a place where people come to create new lives and create new cultures based on where they came from or who they marry or who they decide to create a family with, um, then I don't know. We're not America. Yeah. Then. Do you think that's changed over the last 30 years, 50 years, that that sense that it's it's much more defined? Or you 
you know, no. we're much more apart from the rest of the world, or I, we I think we're, we're aware. We we there are some of us who think of ourselves as being apart because we're the quote unquote land of opportunity, um, and maybe we are uh, compared to a lot of other countries. Um, so I'm not saying that we're not the land of opportunity, but those of us who become citizens have to remember that we weren't always citizens. I, I think um, there are also many different Im immigrant situations. You know, people come to this country for opportunity, maybe for education, or because their other family members are here. But in your case, of your family and also the characters in here, they came to this country as refugees. They came here to escape because they would have suffered in a way because of the new regime, the, the changes. Um, it was a little bit similar with my family in the early days that they came over. They had left a communist country. They had to come or starve. But, um, and it puts a different spin on a story. When you have people who've immigrated and, and have this thing in the past, wealthy, you know, businesses, homes, prestige, status, um, and they come here and they had to put that behind. Tell me something about what's in this book that relates to what happened to your family. Because in the book jacket, it says, based on the real events of, of Suzanne's family, and you think, oh, that everything is true I in know. this book. And, and so we I wanted to... We don't write that copy, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I wanted to, you know, give an indication that it's... There are some very dramatic parts of your family story that are in here, but much of it is different. Right. It, but indicative of a lot of refugees. Indicative. So yeah. the characters are all, except for one character, the characters are all made up completely. And um, my the way I write is I, my plots are, I mean, my plot is always character driven. So I have to know each character super well before I can really understand what's gonna happen in the story. So I may start with somebody real, but then ultimately that person, you know, that character um, changes and becomes somebody else. There's only one person in the story who is based on a real person, and that's Olga, who is the sort of nanny, governess, whatever. And I actually started this book to honor her because we were separated. She went back to Iran willingly, but then got stuck there. And so we did not, we were not able to see each other. And we missed each other a great deal. And yes, she came to our family when I was 13 and she was an unconventional woman. And all of the things that I say about her in, in the book are true. Um, in fact, she went to the bazaar for me <laughs> and <laughs> she got that, that's a special stone called an arir uh, in Farsi. It, and, and she had it, in, I told her to have it inscribed with joy and luck in Farsi for you after you blurbed my first book. I so, didn't know that she was the one who had gone to yes, get it. Yes. I love that character. Olga. Yeah, I mean, she, she's just, she says it like it is, yeah. and she's... I wrote a whole um, book about, in, in her voice, the story of her. You can have the sequel. And nobody wanted to buy it. So um, maybe eventually, some, somehow. But she has a really rich backstory. Um, as, far, as far as my family is concerned, I will say this. My father was not a refugee. My father was the rebel in his family, just as Mitra in this book is the rebel. Actually, I think of Mitra, Shireen, all of them as being rebellious in some way or another because to change and go against tradition, you have to be somewhat of a rebel. It's just the way we do it is, is different for everyone. But my father was one of six brothers and he came to the United States in 1950 and started a business here that was here and also back in Iran, a pharmaceutical business. And, um, and he married my mother who was, and he was an American born and raised in the Bronx of um, what was then considered a mixed marriage, Jewish and Christian. And, um, and he took her back to Iran and she 
fit in, and he came from a very conservative religious family. So that's another story in itself. I wrote part of a memoir <laughs> yeah. about that too before I didn't, nobody wanted it. So um, for the writers out there, nobody wants it ever uh, until somebody does. <laughs> so keep the faith. Um, so I think I answered your question. So the refugee yeah. thing, and then, you know, our family lost everything. We were very, very successful family in Iran and respected. And suddenly everybody had to come out. And most of them came to the United States. So this, if, if you want to look at this as something about my family, it's really about that movement, that migration, and what it feels like, not only to people who have come here, but to the people who are already here. And Amy, you know what this is like. And suddenly, you have a whole bunch of family members who are either living with you, or needing your help, or and your life changes, not always in a bad way, it may be in a good way, but your life changes forever. Yeah, you're sharing a bedroom with five other kids. <laughs> um, I. Um, yeah, I was I was thinking about also that some of these people who come over, whether it's in real life or in your story, they come with a different sense of the politics or what's going on. And of course, the the people who were described in yours are very different from your family. These were um, women brought over who were, you know, different somehow, of a different background, um, and their politics were different too. And I wondered, was that true in your family as well, that they had a different opinion about the Shah, a different opinion about the, the theocracy? And, and they still do. Yes. Um, yes, there's a lot of political polarization in my family, just as there could be in any family. And yes, some of them were pro-Shah, some of them were you know, not political, they just wanted everything to be fine. Um, I have to say that when it comes to um, the, the situation with women in Iran, across the board, 100%, my family, whether they're conservative or not, um, we loathe this regime, and um, we want them out. And um, we want them out as fast as, and we have since the beginning. It was, it was just, it's just been terrible in that sense, not being able to go back, not being, you know, seeing the way these um, theocrats are running the country. It's sort of like what I tell my American friends is imagine, and this is San Francisco, so maybe I can say here, imagine that Trump was in power for 45 years. That's what it feels like. That's what it's like. Trump and his cronies, 45 years. So. Okay, you're, you have lived most of your life in the United States now, and so um, you can be rebellious with impunity almost without having your, your legs cut off. But I was, what kind of rebelliousness, you know, there's inner rebellion as well. A lot of this book is about rebellion, rebelliousness to be independent of mind, rebelliousness against family and expectations. Um, and, you know, also with that, this was, this was really surprising to me, this rebelliousness of what we mean by belonging. You know, belonging is always thought to be a good idea. You want to belong to a country. You want to belong to a family. You want to belong to somebody who loves you and who you love. But then you talked about belonging in a different way that almost had to do with less freedom and having to almost rebel from that, that kind of belonging? So this is an interesting question, because I am not rebellious like my main character, nor have I been rebellious like her sister, who is rebellious in her own quiet, secretive way. I am generally, although, I may seem rebellious on the outside. As my father says, I am very obstinate. <laughs> but I am dutiful. And I needed to write a character who wasn't for myself. 
I wanted to, I couldn't be that rebellious, but I wanted to be. The thing is, being a writer is rebellious. And so what you've done is taken a lot of these ideas and these concepts and, and things that many people have placed on them and you bring it to surface, you bring it to the attention. And that, writing is a form of rebellion and that's it's what true. I think. It's I true. think that's what you've done. Thank you. <laughs> rebellion or delusion, maybe. <laughs> but thank you, Amy. That's yeah, no, it's, it's yeah. Um, we, there was another word that you've talked about that I think is really interesting. It relates a lot to what this family is about, and it's the term polyculturalism, as distinguished from multiculturalism. And I think it's very hard to define in a concrete way because it is, it is amorphous. It is ever-changing. It is contamination and influence and inspiration. I mean, it's hard to get around and you see it much more clearly when you take a story and impose that. Or you don't impose, impose anything. The family dynamic brings out these, the nature of that when the family is actually of different cultures, of different times and generations. Um, but I know you've talked about polyculturalism outside of writing fiction, can you? Yeah, so this, uh, polyculturalism is a word that's that's not used that much in the States, um, but in um, Australia, New Zealand, and um, in Britain it's used more often. So for me, this is how I see it. Multiculturalism is when cultures pretty much stay static and we move between them. And belonging becomes more like a um, more like a stage play. So you you have to code switch in order to. And belonging is really about code switching well enough, which is what I did for the first twenty years of my life. Um, polyculturalism is when you make a decision to accept and integrate different parts of your culture, your cultures that you may have grown up in, and you create something new. So the family may be a traditional family, but ultimately it, it, it will fracture under the pressures of modernity or movement, migration, whatever. So the best way to maintain the family, which in my mind is always the best thing, uh, is to morph it into something different. It's still a family, but it's not exactly the kind of family that the patriarchal construct has defined. So for me, that's the ideal, and that, for me, is what America should be like, and that's what yeah. I, I hope for, and that's, that's what I learned writing this book. I didn't understand. Mm. Yeah. You know, there was so much I learned writing this book. There was so much agony <laughs> and self-searching and ask my husband, he was, you know, tearing his hair out. Uh, you know, I mean, it just was a very um, difficult thing to write. It took me a long time. It really took me 10 years because I didn't start this novel until 2006. It took me 10 years and then it took me five years to sell it. Um, writers. Uh, so, yeah, I think I answered. Yeah. Um, you know, when you were saying that it's, it's something that you learned or you realized your understanding of this grew, and I think that's, that is true of so many writers that as you, as you put a book together, it's almost like a, com a container that you can start putting things in that you're learning. Whether you learn it by Googling and doing research or through life experience, it all becomes part of your consciousness and it goes into the novel. Or you're writing it and somehow you don't even realize that these are the things that are coming out, what you know. And, and have you ever written parts of this book and then you go back and you reread it and you say, gosh, how All did the I time. know that? Where did All that come from? <laughs> All the <laughs> like, time. I mean, I had that feeling when I was reading this. I say, how does Suzanne know that? How did she know to just put it into those words? So that's 
you told me that last night we were texting yeah. and Amy was, and also she, you did the video and it's like, how did she know this? And I, I actually, my dad called me and he was like, how did you know such things? <laughs> how you know this? My mother would say, yeah. how you know this? How you, you know this? <laughs> and you must have a very good vocabulary. <laughs> you do. So. Your vocabulary in here is excellent. The words that she chooses are, are wonderful words. Um, yeah, that was that was the other. Yeah, thing, it was but. interesting. It was the first time um, my dad actually. I have to say this. He's ninety nine. I'm I'm in my sixties. It was the first time I really felt like my dad was talking to me like I was not his daughter, a respected writer. It was, <laughs> it was, it was weird. I mean, it was, <laughs> and I even said that to him. It was weird. And then of course I cried. And then it was yeah. It's really hard to answer this question. I know on the spot, you know, you know the book so well, but then somebody says to you, "What, you know, pick out something that you wrote down and you didn't realize that you knew until you wrote it down." Can you think of anything that suddenly caught you and made you, you know, gasp or cry or laugh or? I think what one of the I can, there are so many things really I did learn a lot about myself and about what I thought and and I had to think hard about some issues uh, that were really broad and I and analyze them but the thing one of the things that I did realize was this issue of how immigrants feel about the old country their idea that you know they come here and then they are oh my god I just had a grand grandson, so you know, oh. my oxytocin levels are going oh. through the roof just seeing this. <laughs> oh, so cute, so cute. Anyway, um, so this idea of the way immigrants, so my dad will still, and my husband, will still say things like, Iran isn't like that, or Iran can never be this, or they, they don't know. And I'll say, you don't know Iran. Your Iran exists. They're rebellious. You know? Yeah, yeah. Your <laughs> Iran exists only in memory, mm -hmm. and that was something that came out of me mm -hmm. in a line yes. that came out of me in the book yeah. that I realized yeah. was so true. Yeah. That even so, it, imagine if you leave now and you leave this country, and ten years later you want to return. You can't pretend to know what's going on here or what. Life is and like. even the language, your language is mired in the past, your colloquialisms, the terms that are used, you don't have those. That's and right. you go there and everybody knows, yeah. oh yeah, you've been away for a long yeah. time. Yeah. You're American. Yeah. 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 And, yeah. And and you have characters like that who yeah. go back to a different Iran yes. that they remember. And it's one of the reasons why I tell a lot of um, people in the diaspora, the way I feel about what's happening in Iran now is that our job is to support the protesters and hope that we can that they can bring this regime down. Our job is not to get mired in their politics because we don't know anything about that, really. Yeah. You know, the the late great Russell Banks, who just died about ten days ago. Yeah. I first heard him talk in nineteen eighty Five, I believe it was, at the community of writers in what was known as Squaw Valley, now Palisades Tahoe. And he said, every novel is political. And I thought, well, that's not true of mine. That's, I, I don't agree with that. And it took me a very long time to understand what that meant. It was actually something I wrote to Russell as he was dying, just to let him know that his words had stayed with me all these years. Um, and I, I thought about that also in reading your book, because you could, no one would describe this, or no one has described her book as a political novel. Oh, and yet, or they have? No, I, no, very few people have described it that way, but I think of it that way. I absolutely think it is. When we say that all novels are political, for one thing, we are looking at a story that's based in a particular time, in a particular country, with people of certain class and background, a history, personal history, and there are things in there that have influenced, who, that guide our beliefs. And 
it also then guides what we do, our actions. Our actions are activism. And in that way, to me, this book is very political. Well, it's also political because in my view, um, the way the family is structured is then the way the society is structured. Yes. And ultimately, the government is structured. If we are patriarchal, then our government generally is patriarchal. Um, it may not be as stark here or in Europe as it is in Iran, but it's still there. So when I write about this family and the secrets they keep from each other, especially the women who, are, who keep many secrets in order to live, to have self-determination, it's for me, it's not that different from what one of the later characters in the book who's, who is a writer, whose parents were writers under, in Iran, her parents are, are murdered because of their writing. And this is how women are silenced in a regime in, in, in much the same way that we try to silence journalists here as well, not by killing them, but hopefully not. But, you know, um, do by... You, do you yeah. have any trepidation, you know, because it's... Polit I mean, it has views on many sides, but... You know, we're all very aware of what's happened with Salman Rushdie, and right. Um, no. His was a oh. very different kind of a, a book related a lot to, you know, religion and and. Yes, I mean, I I'm not worried. Um, maybe I should be, um, but I'm at an age now where, look, I I have I have a compulsion to write. There's nothing I can do about my writing. It's just uh, what I do. Rebellious, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Um, so I, I, I can't go back to Iran. I know that, and this book will make that for sure. But I haven't been able to go back before well, this. Olga and the character who is has been sent back to Iran. When people talk to her on the phone, they sometimes they have to be a little careful about what they say. Is that true for you? Very true, especially yeah. now. Yeah. Um, you, it's very hard to communicate with people over in Iran. Uh, they have to have a VPN. They have to know how to protect themselves. Um, and that's just normal people. If you're a journalist or an artist, get out. You have to get out. But there yeah. are a lot of people who are just protesting and going in the streets and saying, kill me so that at least the next generation can survive or can be rid of this government. I think one of the clear ways in which um, politics are in novels and, you know, especially with women, is that our views of who we are are, trying, are often dictated to us by what our rights are in that government, you know, in the United States are the, what the laws are having to do with abortion, for example. Um, and so there is a lot of that as well in here, in sexuality, in expectations, in roles that women are supposed to play. Um, and, and what's interesting, it, I found that it was not just about Iran and their expectations. I started reflecting on this book as uh, being so relevant about our own country and how we look at these dichotomies. Um, we can't separate always personal, private, and political, and public, and governmental. Um, and it, it brought that out to me, you know, made me think. And that's what a good novel should do. It should make you think about things. I agree. Um, and I'm glad that it did that. Um, your novels certainly do that for me. Yeah. Uh, I think that for me, for example, what happ what's happening here, oh, questions. I'll, I'll just yeah. say this. What's happening here, for example, when the Roe v. Wade decision was reversed, when the Supreme Court came down in June, I have to say it, I felt like, oh, this is the same feeling I had when the Islamic Republic installed, you know, made it law that you had to wear a hijab. Why is it different? It's not. Yeah. Okay, as I said, I could 
go on forever. I wanted to ask you about how you knew about real estate development, how you, why all the Research. characters have a certain smell to them. You're going to find this wherever these characters go. The houses, everything. I didn't realize this everything. until you said it She to doesn't me. realize it because this is the thing that you are the guide to the universe you created in this story and your way of perceiving the world has a lot to do with smell. And I think that is also part of somebody who's raised with a polyculture. And let me just leave it at that, and we're going to go to questions from the audience. I, thank you. I have, I have a couple of questions that we've already gotten on Zoom or on YouTube. We'll also pass this around if anyone wants to ask a question. But a couple of, let's see. Here's, maybe this, we should have ended with this one, but what are some of your favorite books? Oh gosh, and I was not expecting. Like minutes. It'll be like, how about a two minute answer? What are some of my favorite books? Amy, you go first because. Am I, it's easy. In the, in the time <laughs> of our history, it's excellent. I'm going to be rereading. Um, oh, book. sweetie, you're too much. I'm, I'm going to start crying. Um, of course, all of Amy's books. Um, Wish I had written more than two, and I always admire your stamina and your ability to just focus. Uh, some of my favorite books, um, it's hard to say. I, I, I can't think right now at all. <laughs> that, <laughs> Nothing. You know, it's funny. I get asked that question all the time and on the spot. I can never think of anything. It's like I have never read another novel. <laughs> I have never read anything else, and it's all going through my mind, including if I don't mention that person, they'll be mad at me. Yes. Um, I mentioned this book, and they'll think that I'm, I'm not a very good writer because I'm reading subpar novels or something. <laughs> I don't know. It's a, very, it's a much more difficult question than you realize. It's real. You know, we're talking about, the, and then suddenly, boom, you know, examination question. I will plug one book. Let's plug one book. Um, Robbie Alamedine's The Wrong End of the Telescope. Yeah. Yeah. Highly recommended. Yeah. yeah, and he was in our writer's group. Yeah. We well, have a good hit Until right. we kicked him out. Yeah. <laughs> I have another one. This also came from our online audience. Um, how is your, I think you touched on this a little bit, how is your, your writing compared to Persian poetry and any poets in particular? I mean, I've been exposed to the usual very famous ones. Hafez, who in translation I adore. Rumi, the right translation I adore. And a more modern poet, Furur Efarrochzad. I know it's hard to say, um, but her poetry, especially translated by Sheila Volpe, um, I think she translated the um, book of poetry of hers called Sin, and you can get that in English. Uh, she was Iran's most well-known and tragic feminist poet um, in the 1960s. I'd like to get some audience members. Many of you may have a question. I can't promise I'll get to you in order, but if you want to ask a question, this is your chance. Raise your hand, I'll run over to you. Put the mic, I was doing it wrong. Put it right in front of your mouth about like this and we'll capture that for our online audience and for all of us here. We'll go here. Hi, thank you so much for being here today. Um, it was wonderful listening to the talk. I, you know, you'd mentioned stamina and writing can you know, be very exhausting. You're excavating a lot, you're learning a lot. How do you recharge and what do you turn to when you know, you're not at your desk or you know, at your computer? What, what do you look towards? I'm not sure I, I oh. heard everything. How do I recharge when I'm feeling Over the like... last 26 years, how oh. did you recharge <laughs> to finish so, this book? So here it is. So the truth is compulsion. I, I cannot abandon it. I tried many times to say, I just can't do this anymore, I'm not gonna be a writer anymore, and it just didn't work. Um, that's not to say that I didn't stop actually putting things on the page, 
But I just couldn't stop thinking of stories, and that's the way I've always been. And so I would just recharge. You know, I had a life, I had a son, I had a husband, I have a very large extended family, and they always took precedence. And they're in New York, so I, you know, that, that was, there was a lot of travel. I wrote book reviews, I, I knew other writers, I got involved in other things, I was a volunteer, but I, yeah, I just, no matter what, I just kept coming back to it. And I think what's really important is get the support of other writers around you, even if you're not talking about writing. Even if, and, and I don't mean writers groups, I mean we had a critique group for 15 years that was amazing that it lasted that long. Um, but just people you write with, you know, just write with them and support each other. I think that really was what got me through to finishing this on Zoom with my surveillance writing group every single day. <laughs> Some of them are here. <laughs> I'm paying them to be here. <laughs> but yeah, okay. Hi, um, I, as an artist myself, I tend to be really hyper-focused on just my art, but I've since found importance in being receptive to other things that inspire my art. So I wanted to ask you, besides writers and poets, what other things inspire you? Uh, well, I, I'm, I am so amazed by some of the artwork that's coming out in all genres in all, I don't know, do they call them genres? Do artists call, you know, some of the activist art that's coming out of what's happening in the protests in, in Iran, um, I am just bowled over by some of the, um, there was one, so yes, it all feeds me. I, I mean, painting, um, I think also mosaics and textiles, uh, my grandfather was, into, was involved in textiles in Iran, and my uncle, great uncle, was a, um, a rug weaver, a carpet weaver. So textiles and, um, and carpets, yeah, I mean, art is so inspiring to me. I can't think of any specific examples right now, but keep doing it because it really inspires the work for me. Hello, thank you for the book and uh, outstanding, you know, uh, being an immigrant, uh, you know, from Iran since 85, I immensely enjoyed reading it. Thank you. And question goes back to Olga. Is Olga actually uh, was born in Iran or uh, it sounds she has a Russian or um, uh, sure. No. Eastern European heritage. Thank yes. you. So Olga um, was born in Iran in the north in uh, Mazandaran. Her mother emigrated during the Bolshevik, right after the Bolshevik Revolution from Russia across the Caspian. And that is part of the story that's not that's not in here. So she grew up speaking, you know, Farsi, Russian, Armani, Armenian, um, Azadi as well. Uh, so she really, and her mother had light eyes. She had very fair skin and green eyes. So yes, you guessed right, yes. Thank you. Thank you both so much for being here. And sorry, I won't stand so I don't block. Um, you mentioned being polycultural. I myself would be the anchor baby. And in the writing, I find so many different characters that are not of my culture, but I relate to so much. Was it intentional from your own experiences to draw for both of you, like for characters that were relatable to a wide audience? Or is that your personal experience? Do you find you get that from your group, your families? Or is it just something that comes out in the writing where it just speaks to so many people to their own separate cultural relationship. 
so many things in there, sorry. <laughs> I, I, you know, I, I just have to write the stories that are there. They often have to do with characters who are women. I could certainly try to write a, a book about a character who's a man, but it would be why. Why bother? Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, just to prove something. The, the stories <clears throat> that interest me then do have something to do with my, my upbringing, my background. Um, although I can see myself doing stories in a different time, another time, because the ideas are universal. Or I could see myself doing characters who are half Asian, because, and that split sense of my identity being American and Chinese. It's, it's not just racial, you know, it's, a, it's one that has to do with identity. And I, We're so, we're so involved in categorizing ourselves, um, pigeonholing ourselves, or at least, you know, like we're dice, like somebody's cut us into many, many, many pieces and we define each one separately. And that's fine, but I think it's also really important for us to remember that we're all human beings and there are so many things about our cultures, whether they're, um, Latinx culture, I mean, I have two sisters-in-law who are from Central and South America. I, you know, our family is now filled with Asians and Iranians and Americans and Dutch people and, you know, I mean, Spanish people. So I think that it just, we need to be a little more loose about all of this and realize that if I write a story about an Iranian American family, it's an American family. And you're gonna find so many things that you can relate to. Uh, just as in Amy's books, I mean, I never thought of Amy as being really Chinese. I mean, she's American, um, right? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, in the, in the old days, you know, my books would be under, under Asian literature, never American literature, and it's a separate category. One time, the second book, Kitchen God's Wife, it was placed under cookbooks. Oh. <laughs> I remember that. That was hilarious. <laughs> that was great. Hi, Suzanne. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about those 26 years um, in terms of writing and whether the writing that supposedly failed or didn't get published how that led to this eventual book. Um, are you kind of uh, relieved maybe that, that this, anyway, just talk about how, how maybe the, I guess as writers, we all wanna know that our failures and the stuff's in, in our drawers is actually leading us somewhere to a better place. You are inspiring for those 26 years. I of I being kept involved. looking and trying You're not to look in inspired. the mirror. <laughs> Listen, you know, somebody who's delayed, you're very inspiring to come out with such a beautiful book. Too. Thank you. Well, I mean, Carolyn, thanks for coming, by the way. It's great to see you. I haven't seen you in so long. Anyway, um, okay, I, I mean, I would reveal every humiliation that occurred to me during the time between when my last book came out and this book just so that writers would understand that it's not easy, but it's also not about the publication, it's about the writing. And I know that sounds cliche, but you have to find some, some kind of joy, some kind of knowledge, something that fills you in the actual writing and also in talking about it and in the people around you who can talk to you about it. Um, so I, I do think that it's, it was really hard. I won't say it was easy. And maybe it was delusional, delusional of me to think that I, sh I would have ever get this published. But just be with it. You're a writer, you're a writer. It doesn't, the publication is later. And if it happens, you'll be like me up here. And if it doesn't, and it very well may not have, because this book went out for auction to 30 publishers and nobody took it. And that was in 2017. 
So five years later, I sold it. Thank you both of you all. Um, it was an amazing talk. Here. Hi. Yeah. Um, so as a writer myself and identifying as polycultural, um, I often find it hard to base my novel in a specific location. So what advice do you have for someone who feels like the old world is a bit strange and the new world is still very new? Um, how did you find the right balance to do that? So the old world, you, you feel like the old world is strange and you don't, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch everything. I think my hearing is bad, Amy. Yeah, um, so basically I, as a new immigrant, I, when I go back home, it's not completely strange, but I do feel like I don't know the world and now here it, everything's really new. So like, okay. I don't know where to base it. I understand what you're saying. So for the first 20 years of my life, I went back and forth. So I lived in New York, and then we would go to Iran for a year. And I would go to school there, and then we'd come back, and I'd be here for another two years. And then we'd go back, and I'd be there. And then later, it was during the summers. I never felt like I fit in in either place. And that's a really common feeling for what we call third culture kids, kids who are brought up either transnationally or whatever. Um, and all you want is to belong or to explain your other part to everybody else. So if you're writing about it, my advice, I didn't really be, I wasn't able to conquer or to understand that feeling until after I couldn't go back anymore. Um, my advice to you is that just write who you are. You're both. You don't have to define one or the other. You are who you are, and there are other people like you who will relate. Don't think that you're writing to an empty audience. I don't know if I helped to answer that. I don't know if I answered the one question. It's the masks, and <laughs> we'll blame the masks it on that. Are We're hard, losing our yeah, hearing. I'm gonna blame it on that. You know, I, I, I would just add that when you're in flux like that and you feel like you don't belong to one and you're not quite fitting in the other, that is an excellent point where you start a story. That is a story because it has that tension, it has the ambiguity, and you're working towards something else. So your storyline is to find out with this character who she is. That's the storyline. She's right. <laughs> that very thing you asked me. I was intrigued by your uh, statement that all books are political. And when I first came in tonight, I was, I have not read your book yet, Susan Barr, but I will, but I've read a lot of, of Amy's book. And I was thinking about the Joy Luck Club, that one part where she realizes that she has stopped being herself in order to please her husband. And so she loses all her self-identity. And I was thinking that such a feminist, such a political statement that happens to so many women, that when we marry or when we get into relationships, we try to please, and it is a political statement, I think, in the book. When you were writing it, did you see it that way? As being a feminist or political viewpoint, or was it just purely personal? I wouldn't have looked at it in quite that way. In fact, when Russell Banks said that to me, it was during the writing of the Joy Luck Club, so um, it wasn't until later I, I realized how much our beliefs are infused with the beliefs or what is imposed on us by the culture, by the government. Um, being a feminist, I don't know whether I would have called myself that because um, it was just the way that I was. I was raised with the original feminist mom who, who believed I should become a doctor so I could leave my husband if he ever treated me poorly. <laughs> that I should never feel like I needed to have a kid and that I should never let anybody more powerful tell me who I was. So my mother was a feminist and I was, that was just the status quo of who I was supposed to be.
Uh, hi, first of all, congratulations, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank <laughs> um, you. I was really intrigued by what you were saying about coming up with characters before you came up with the story or the plot. <laughs> Maybe, I should, maybe this is clear. Yeah, Chris. How you, how you came up with the uh, the characters before you came up with the plot? I'm just curious, sort of, how you go about doing something like that. And then, I guess, as a, as a part to that question, um, did the plot itself emerge in ways that surprised you? Like you didn't know really this was going to be the book it became. I think he's asking me about the characters moving the plot how you came up with these characters, chose them, and then the direction right. the story went, which is, so it's got a really strong narrative pull too, so yeah, how you did know, you keep I, that going? I think for me, when I think of a story, I think of the end, where I want my characters to wind up. Um, they don't always wind up there, but it's usually close. Uh, so it's like years of getting there. And I use the characters, so I managed to spend a great deal of time working on them as characters. I start by looking at photographs in magazines. I look to see, is this what this person would look like maybe? Is this what this person would wear? What color? I mean, really down to the whether she polishes her nails. Um, what, what she smells like. What, oh, that's, uh, she's right. Amy's right. I mean, I had no idea, but you're right. Smell. <laughs> um, yeah, so all of those particulars get done before I even start writing the story. The story comes from who they are. And... Even, this, even the character of Olga, who's based on a real person, I mean, there are a lot of things she does in the book that she never did in real life, but she had to fit in to the story. So I had to think to myself, okay, what would Olga do? And I'm always asking myself that. What would so-and-so do in this situation? Or if I want so-and-so to do this, what has to happen in the story for them to do this? I think of Olga almost being like a, a truth detector or its opposite, you know, that she... Yeah, I think so too. No. Yeah. 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 There, there is a lot in the, in the original version where she, she is very um, active. She's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, she's my favorite. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Hi, Susan. How? Hi, Amy. Um, Hi. I'm right here. <laughs> okay. Um, it's so interesting, Amy, that you brought up the notion that this is, or may or may not be a political novel and whether Suzanne thinks of it as that. Um, I've been thinking about, and I of course notice the title uh, in the time of our history. It strikes me that works of fiction like this that are, you know, almost auto-fiction or at least very strongly informed by the author's own history, are also actually historical novels. Um, and I wonder whether you thought about that and whether you did additional research um, in order to bolster sort of the exact accuracies of, of the events uh, and the history of the past 40 something years for your work of fiction. And I ask that specifically because you had mentioned that you had written you had started writing a, a memoir and, and that you abandoned because nobody was buying it, et cetera, et cetera. And you yourself were, with the Dreamcatcher, were a part of that first wave of now this great body of work that has been produced uh, essentially by women writers from the Iranian diaspora about that historical moment, the 1979 frozen moment <laughs> in all of our, our lives that have uh, greatly changed all of our lives. So I wonder whether you thought about that as a historical work. Did it sort of emerge from your um, work of uh, nonfiction, your memoir? I, so history has always been really, really important to me. So, I mean, I'm very interested in it. And, you know, I could, I would call this a historical novel. Uh, but, you know, historical novels, people think of them as happening maybe 
decades or centuries ago. This is 20, this is 20 years in the past, on the, takes place on, in 1998, 1999. But for me, I, I am really, really, it's very important to me that I don't have any inaccuracies because I, I actually, myself, when I read, I don't like to have to wonder whether this is this historical fact or timeline has been made up by the author or whether it was accurate. So for me, that's just a personal feeling. It has to be accurate. And I, I actually, one of my cousins just informed me of two mistakes I made in the book. Um, <laughs> And uh, so I'll have to, you know, come clean and correct those at some point, very minor, but still. So I'm very particular about that, and I studied history a great deal. And the chain murders, which are the murders of the writers and intellectuals that happened in the 90s and 80s, uh, I researched those a great deal before I decided to put a character in there who might have who would have been related to any of those people. So everything historically is accurate. And I know Amy's books are all historically accurate. I mean, especially Valley of the Amazement, of Amazement was, I mean, incredibly researched, Amy. Yeah. I know whether they had toilet paper back then. Yeah. In the 1800s. Yeah. <laughs> no, no I, th I think to your, your point, history, politics has to include history because there is the, what was the propulsion that led to where we are in these political times. That's why I, I just thought, you know, the title is so apt, because there is a lot to do with these times and how it's changing. And it could be going back to an even an earlier time in Iran's history that also included the history of this family. But you can take any segment of it, and you can see the history has so much to do with the politics and this family. Everything, yeah. 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 All right, everyone, that concludes our talk. Thank you, a big round of applause. Good for job, good job. Thank you. Thank you. And Thank you everyone Thank for coming. Thank you so much for coming. They'll be signing the books outside in the lobby, outside the Corrette Auditorium. So join us out there if you'd like to get a book signed. Thank you.